the voice said, do you want to go back? And for me, and you'll hear this, not very often, some of us are given choices to go back. Some don't want to go back. They want to stay where they are. But I was given a choice to go back. And why this is so important, because I got a chance to see my life going forward. I got a chance to see my past. I got a chance to see my life review. But I also got a chance to see my future. Do you want to go back, the voice said. And I said, yes. I knew the complications I would experience medically. I knew the relationships that would leave me. I knew it all. But I also saw... Okay, my guest today is Peter Anthony, who had a near-death experience. And after his experience, his life has been guided by repetitive numbers. Are you seeing 1111? Are you seeing 2222? Well, Peter's going to explain what these numbers and their significance are because this has been illuminated for him in his life. And he also highly connects with the angelic realm. So Peter, welcome. I am so excited to talk to you today. Oh, thank you so much. And I say to your listening audience, as I say to all my listening audiences, today is a choice. Whenever this interview comes out, we all have hurried schedules. We all do things that we go about our day. And if you decide to listen to this today, then I say thank you very much. I always say, take what applies and dismiss what doesn't. We're all at different levels. Flowers bloom at different times. So allow the message to at least sink in. And then if it doesn't resonate, come back next year and listen to it again and see what happens. I love that. We're speaking the same language. I say the same thing too. This is great. Well, we're going to have a wonderful conversation today because it's great to hear about the near-death experience, but I'm oftentimes even more interested in how your life has evolved and changed afterwards. So before we get into the near-death experience, will you share a little bit about what your life was like before this happened? Yeah, I was... So oftentimes people find it very difficult to believe that I was a shy, introverted person. I had a a slight a speech impediment I still do and so to speak publicly uh, to go on camera like today oh my god it was just very difficult so I, I people that know me for many years know that if I spoke or nodded my head yay Peter spoke and he you know he had something to say and I think after my near-earth experience that completely changed I haven't stopped talking hey so the person before Worked for the news division at CBS. I was a study to become a special effects makeup artist. That was my love. That was my desire. That was my passion. I was a gifted artist. And uh, so my calling was to make monsters. I could paint. I could sculpt. I could mold. I could do uh, character portraits. I could uh, watercolor, pen and ink, you name it. I could do it all. And so and play, uh, excuse me, and lots of clay uh, molding. So that to me at the time seemed the perfect thing to do. Agnostic, I was raised in a family that was strictly Catholic. Uh, so my background was just go to Catholic school, go to catechism, go to mass 24 seven. And uh, so I think for me, looking back at all those early years of my life, knowing the Peter that I am, it's like I look back at someone that is almost is as a stranger to me. So driven by money, driven by success, driven by becoming a special effects like makeup artist, and all that changed, of course, the night of my near-death experience. Okay. Well, why don't you tell us in whatever way you want to share what happened with your near-death experience? Yeah, I was celebrating my birthday. And we I had finished doing a tribute to the MGM years. Well, we were, I think this particular segment that we were working on at the time was dedicated to that Hollywood golden era of Betty Davis and I can't remember who else it was, Catherine Hepburn, Greg Garson, who I was assigned to. And we were doing a little rap party, and I also went to another birthday party. And it was at that second party that I became a member blowing up my birthday cake, the candles on the birthday cake, and I could feel this pain in my abdomen. Now, I kind of backtrack here. I, six months prior, um, I had been misdiagnosed. The doctor thought I had a stomach ulcer, and they were giving me tagamet, which was to kind of soothe the ulcer in the stomach. And my part, or actually my lack of not taking a part in my own health, I just did not follow up with the doctor's appointments. I just thought, well, if one tablet works, then three will work. And so, <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened. By the time I went from June the 4th until November the 11th, 
I was losing weight, a lot of weight. I went from like 165 to like 135, down to 110, wine to 100. I think by the time I got out of the hospital, I stayed at 85 pounds for almost two years. Um, and I wasn't able to walk and I certainly lost my vision for a long period of time. So that all to me, looking back at that period of time in my life was rather the difficult uh, part of my life. But anyway, back to your original question, blowing out candles, the abdomen or the pain in my abdomen and the, uh, the left side of my body was so excruciating. I excused myself, went to the bathroom and I passed out briefly on the floor, woke up. And I thought, I'm just dizzy. I don't know what it was. Maybe I was tired. I didn't know. You, in your own mind, you start writing scripts. What it is, you try to diagnose yourself of what it is. And of course, I think men, I can get through this and I'm okay. And I went home and I opened up the door and it happened again. And my neighbor found me there by my front door. I think this, the, 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 at this particular time in my, looking back at this particular time in my life, this is where the drama began. Uh, David was smart. I was bleeding on my suit. So we changed out of my suit and tie. We put on some thrift clothes. I always had some old uh, clothes going to the Salvation Army. So we put on some thrift clothes because I was bleeding and some old tennis shoes and mismatched socks and a baseball hat. And I passed out again. He called the ambulance. And I remember the lights flashing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I remember the panic on their faces. And they were asking me questions I, I didn't have the answers to. I didn't know. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I told them that I had a stomach ulcer and I was taking Tagamet. That was all I was taking. And by the time I got to the hospital, things just took a, just went south. Back during that period of time, we were in the AIDS epidemic. People were kind of frightened like they were when we had COVID. And people didn't want to go near us. They, anyone they thought had AIDS. I had these little lesions on my neck and my torso and my face. So throughout the summer, because I was wearing the news division, I would take makeup and cover this up where people could see my face and my neck. And because I'd lost so much weight, I was stuffing Kleenex and newspapers in my suit so they could see that I lost weight. And so uh, one that by the time I got to the ER, they refused to check me in because they just assumed that I had AIDS. I didn't know at the time that I had tuberculosis, thus the cough. I didn't know that I had Crohn's disease, thus the bleeding. I didn't know that I had a perforated viscous, which is an intestinal you know, lining burst or bursting, I should say. Or, and so this misdiagnosis, this social prof profiling at that time in my life, I think was probably the first lesson of learning to be humble because they assumed, number one, I was homeless uh, because of the clothes I had on. They assumed that I was gay and they assumed that that I had AIDS. And so this whole, uh, and it was crazy that night. It was just, it was a full moon that night. And I remember it, things were just crazy. The pandemonium, the, I remember looking around in the waiting room and the people had been shot and, and people had been beaten. It was just a whole array of people who were just, in my opinion, looked worse off than me. But I eventually got in and the intern that rolled me back towards the ER waiting area, God, he suited up like I was radioactive. I mean, I remember all I could see were his eyes and he kept looking down and I knew he was young. I could just about tell by his eyes and his, in the skin, but I could see the perspiration on the, on his forehead. And I remember this, like this long drawn out drop of sweat just came down and he just pushed me in the hallway and left me there. So I, I don't know how long I was there. I think probably an hour and a half, if that, maybe longer. And then a nurse came in, saw me there by the exit, and stepped in and became my, my I guess, my lifesaver of that night. So that was part two of that drama. Part three, she went to, I guess, to bat for me, made sure that I got checked in. She pushed me into my, I was on a gurney and still bleeding. I could hear her arguing with the anesthesiologist, with the other nurses, and uh, some other people. And I remember she said that he's a young man. We are doctors and we are nurses, and it is our responsibility, our job, to help this man out. And and then I remember the one of the doctors saying, I don't want to say her name, but nurse, blah, 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 what have you done? You have exposed us to the AIDS virus. She came in. Now listen to this. Back during the, in the late 80s, we had all this how you got AIDS supposedly, but we didn't know it was airborne at the time. 
We didn't know if it was transferred through through blood, needles, et cetera. Obviously, it was sexually transmitted dis- disease at, at that time. But so little knowledge we knew about the AIDS virus. And there was more hype about the virus than there was needed. Me being in the news vision, I was well aware of that. So once again, social profile. Once again, a humbling experience looking back at that. But going back to this particular nurse, I remember she came in. She said, this is going to hurt. She stripped my foot clothes off, washed me, left the room, came back with mop and soap, soapy water, and mopped the floor because I had blood everywhere. And so going back to that moment in our history, we didn't know. And so I, looking back at that moment, she really went out of her way to take care of me. And talking to you this morning this afternoon she was my hero i still keep in contact with her daughter and so we that whole moment in my life was one of those moments where tragedy steps in and you walk through the conflict and it becomes miraculous and i think for me as i said looking back at that moment in my life we never know that the people we're going to meet that very day or the very people who are going to save our life and become long-term friends so I went into, eventually she got me to the OR admitting area. I was passing in out of a consciousness. It was at that time that I began to feel this pull here on my solar plexus, as though something had attached itself, like a cord. And I remember I was being pulled. Or it was like someone was just rowing me towards them. I, this is just me giving you an interpretation of what happened that night. But I remember at that time, before going into the EOR, I could see the beginning stages of the, of the spinning tunnel, the, the, I call it the bullseye, not knowing, of course, what this was. And I got into the OR. I remember they put me on to the operating table and looking back at that moment again in my life, I remember how cold that table was. I remember the anesthesiologist trying to find, to put IV into my arms anywhere. I had lost so much blood and so much weight that the IVs kept popping out. So it became like a critical for them to find a place to put the IVs in. And at that point, I remember I just went out. It was like five, four, three, two, one, boom. What's interesting about that is, and many people do talk about this with near-earth experiences, this floating sensation of me, Peter Anthony, in spirit form. Now, the reason why I say spirit form is because when you're up here in spirit form, you don't see like this translucent little hands and arms and chest and legs. It's just what you see is like that the eye of a camera. And me in spirit form, looking down at Peter Anthony in physical form, it was as though everything around me was in 3D. I could see their name tags. I could see their fingernails. I could see the tennis shoes. I could see the cart. I could see all this but everything went into slow motion. Everything was just almost as a, a, not quite frozen in time or motionless, but certainly was a pause. And I remember them looking at the cart and I remember the, the paddles coming to my chest and it was just that moment of my physical body jumping. And then once again, I go back to that cord attaching itself to my solar plexus. Now, again, physical form versus spirit form. I can't really describe it. If it was physical form attached to the physical part of Peter Anthony where this was being attached, or if this was connected to the ethereal or the spirit form of Peter Anthony, the feeling of being vacuumed into this spinning tunnel uh, was the next event of, of this near-death experience. Everything went in slow motion. I was met by people from my current life that had apparently had passed. Interesting enough, I talk about this quite a bit in, in my near-death lectures and stories. And I don't know why in particular this one woman became a part of my near-death experience, was my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy. And why I saw this teacher, looking back at that moment in my life, it's not that I had this great connection to her, because I could go back to my first grade teacher, my fifth grade teacher, my high school English teacher, I could have all these connections to all these teachers that I really would say today, that thank you for being such a great teacher. But she was there. Um, and the person that I saw was this young, vivacious, gorgeous woman, as opposed to this overweight, browse furred, 
very sad, kind of hunched over being. So uh, it's not that I had a chance to look at her life from start to finish, but what I remember sensing was whatever happened to her that went from this beautiful, energetic spirit to this person who seemed rather liftless, it was eye-opening for me for some reason. Um, I, I will, we can talk about that later. Anyway, going into the, the near-death experience, tunnel spinning. Um, the colors that you see, the sound that you hear, the ethereal music, the melodic music, male voices, female voices, androgynous voices, wherever you want to, however you wish to identify it, were, do I use the word angelic? Yes. It's almost as though tapping into Mozart's Requiem Mass in C minor, that trance music of its time, but something more contemporary. I was hearing the mathematical codes, the quantum physics, quads. So here I am in this spinning, rotating tunnel, and I'm surrounded by these quantum physics codes, numbers. I remember seeing 1111, 222, 333 as though these numbers were spinning all around me in like a love tunnel, just encircling me. And I think what's most amazing about that, as you're seeing these numbers before you have all these colors that to this day haven't been a former artist, certainly not any colors I'm familiar with, hearing sounds, hearing voices, hearing this melodic trance music that to this day, when I do meditation, I search so intensely to try and find that music to get me into this altered state of consciousness. And so that's part of my mission where I am today. But all this music and sound and color surrounding me. What I found interesting about this, and the first thing I remember uh, experiencing in this tunnel, and again, consciousness, you're not in a physical form. You are now the eye of the camera as you're spinning through this tunnel. You understand that there is no judgment. We, throughout history, have been manipulated and guided by other people's opinions, politically, religiously, even personally. And I think for me, the first thing I recognize within my subconscious and even superconscious, there is no such thing as judgment. There is no Catholic, there is no Muslim, there is no gay, there is no straight, there is no, I am wealthy, you are poor. Where you are in this tunnel, you are encapsulated, you're in this whole sphere of love, kindness, compassion. And I think me, consciously, what I got at that moment is that you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. That became very apparent to me at that moment. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I remember that just as almost like echoing in my brain, in my mind, in my subconscious, you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. The other thing that I find to this day, looking back at this moment in my life, the collective intelligence. Now this is very important. The collective intelligence is that of, imagine the mind of Darwin, imagine the mind of Einstein, imagine the mind of Tesla, imagine the mind of your college professor, imagine the mind of your third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy. All the education, all the teachings, all the dogma, everything you've been taught, Catholic school, it's as though I took a crash course in history for the planet. It's like reading the Bible from zero to 60 and downloading every bit of it, and you got it but not in terms of how it's been handed to us century after century after century. Going back to there is no Catholic, there is no uh, Muslim, there is no Buddhist. It is all of these teachings, all of these dogmas that I learned on the other side. We as a collective consciousness, and this is very important to your listening audience, we as a collective consciousness cannot go forward into where we're going here in this next several years without understanding the dogma of all religion, without understanding science, and without merging new thought consciousness within all three of these. Because that's where we're supposed to be. It's not like religion is the end all, and it's not like science is the end all, and it's not like new age thought consciousness is the end all. It is the merging of all three because that's where we should be. It's almost like you can't, if an example, my elevator, you can't get to the elevator without pushing the code. And then that takes you to the next floor. Then you have to go through the security gate. You have to go through all these different chambers to understand how one thought consciousness works. 
And I think what I'm seeing so often times here is that we are at a critical point in our collective consciousness where so many people are awakening. And I think if I had to share something with your audience, I was awakening to a new way of thinking, a new way of, of understanding consciousness. Back to zero to 60, going back to all the thoughts that you understood, that you were taught. It's almost like just reading every, every history book, like reading every math book, you just get it. And what so many people ask me when I talk about this, well, why didn't you ask this? And how come this is happening? You are not in a logical state of consciousness. You are in, I'm allowing this moment to guide me, consciousness. You allow yourself to accept whatever is before you, not questioning, not doubting, not looking at the colors and not looking at this because of what does that mean? You don't do that. You allow this transition, if you will, to take you to this place called, I guess for me, it was my life review. And so many people who've had near-earth experiences talk about the importance of life reviews, mine as well. I think part of what happened to me, and I did a, a lecture in 2011 in Los Angeles, and I was talking about my life review and how I ended up in this tree. And I remember watching the Game of Thrones. I was watching the, the Stark family come together and the, the Lannisters, all that sort of like the season finale of this tree, how important this tree was. And I remember looking at this tree in the Game of Thrones and I'm thinking to myself, God, I mean, that was the closest thing to that tree that I've experienced. And I was in, in Los Angeles doing this lecture about near-death experiences and life reviews. And this man stood up and he said, oh my God, you're in the tree of knowledge. I still don't know what the tree of knowledge is, but he was just so excited to share that information with me. And so my aha, my inner hunch says, maybe that was the, the tree of life. So I accept that because it makes more sense to me than anything. Because here you are in a tree and before me is an advanced being. Now I want to stop right here because again, I have so many people who comment on my uh, interviews and TV shows and podcasts. Oh, you had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I said, no, I cannot say to this day that the, that the intelligent being that I encountered was Jesus Christ. It just did not feel as though that's what it was. Maybe it was, I don't know. I can't say, are you Jesus? And he said, yes. That's not what went into my consciousness at the time. However, what I did experience was something far more intelligent and far more divine than I ever had in my entire life. And so again, I allow this being, this advanced being to just be there with me. And I talk about something that's really important. We go back into that transparent, that translucent ethereal form that we're in, the eye of the camera. What happens is you, it's almost as though there's a psychic connection to the, the upper chakra the head chakra you're communicating through the indigo the cobalt blue because all around this being a gold being is all this purple bluish color and as i'm sitting in this tree it was like five four three two one my life review and i go back to that same equation zero to sixty our life review is just that from the time you're born until the time i saw myself dying in the operating room on november the 11th in operating room 11 at 11 11 p.m for one minute and 11 seconds that whole 11 11 for me became looking back at it where i am today in my consciousness was the beginning of my mission so as i watched being born uh, as i watched my first second third birthday as i watched going into preschool as i watched going to catholic school as i watched going to mass as i watched one moment in my life, I was very sick and went to the doctor, had asthma, and they, my mom and the doctor were talking out in the hallway. And there were all these little army men there on, on the doctor's desk. And as a child, I think it was five, six, seven years old, I decided to take one. And I saw myself taking this little army, this little soldier, and hiding it. And I'm watching this moment, me as a child, stealing something. And so as I'm watching this, and me, the adult Peter Anthony, is going, you are aware of what you're doing every second of your life. 
every second. And so look at it this way. It's as though you're watching your own diet Coke commercial with the slice of life of every moment. The sun rises, the sun sets, the stars are out. You're talking to someone in the park. You're having a conversation with the teacher or someone, a friend in the hallway. You're driving to, to work. All these moments are your moments. And this is so important. These moments that we forget about, these conversations, I'll share this with you. Every person that is in your life, the stranger on the street, the person at the, the pharmacy, uh, the person on the telephone that you're having a conversation with disputing the, your cable bill, every person in your life is a part of your feature film. Sometimes you have those day players, sometimes they're extras, and sometimes you have those stars in your life. All these profound people who have make landmark uh, imprints on your heart. And I've learned throughout my life that sometimes those people who are on the peripheral part of your movie can play a big part in your life. So every person that is in your life matters. Every second matters. And so I come back with this passion, live your life because every breath that you take is a gift. It is so important to understand that. And we get caught up in the opinions. We get caught up in the politics. We get caught up in the lack of money. We get caught up in all the wrong things. Whereas I said, if we understand that our consciousness is about love, how are we showing love today? Who are we helping? Are we extending our hand to the homeless person? Are we helping someone across the park who has fallen off their bicycle? What are we doing? What I say to people, look up. Life is everywhere around you. And I see so oftentimes, even when I do my lecture, all these people on the telephones looking down and there's so much that we're missing. And so I think for me, coming back, my, my zest for life, my, my wanting to live and to make a difference is just, it's just tattooed into my heart. So back to my life with you, every moment I saw I didn't judge Peter Anthony. I didn't look down and go, wow, you were rude to that lady at the pharmacy, or wow, that was great. The conversation you had with that nurse on the telephone that moment. What I did looking down at Peter Anthony, and I say this so often and I mean it, we could all do better. We all know that little ping, we shouldn't do that. We know that. And those little pings that we get every moment, every day, we're in a hurry, we're in the car, we're driving to our interview, we're going to work, we're having type A personality <laughs> behind the wheel, whatever it is, you see those moments. And I think for me, I also saw my ego. Where I shined, where I let something become better than me, kind of like that whole pounding of the chest, look at me, I'm great. I saw those moments, but I also saw myself doing things that I was humbled by things of helping people that in my world it just seemed to do the right thing so going back to that moment of not judging yourself but understanding that you have a whole different perspective when you see what you should have done didn't do could have done wanted to do and that changed everything for me and so i think for all of you who are listening to this Think about those moments that you had with your, those moments of conflict with your sister or you argue with your dad. I, I think so many people have heard this before and I don't mean to beat a, a, a drum over and over again, but I, my, I love my sister. She was my best friend and she locked her next to me in high school and it was my birthday. And she came up to me and opened her locker and she said, are you going to say how much I love, how much I love you? And you're going to tell me I'm your best friend. And, and all my football buddies are all around me watching, kind of snickering at me. And so I didn't say anything to her. And I remember hearing my thoughts, me, Peter Anthony, in, in spirit form, in theory form, looking down at Peter Anthony. And I could hear her, just go away. Maybe I'm loud. And that was the night that she was killed. Excuse me. And take the time. Arguments are not worth it. 
Tell your husband how much I love you. Tell your husband how much you love him. Tell your girlfriends, your best friends, even compliment your boss. We don't do that. Going back to ego, we're all caught up in our ego because, well, he said that, and I don't like that, and, and, and it's not worth it. Me and my ego, leave me alone. I don't want to hear this. My friends are looking at me. That's ego. It goes back to fear. I was so afraid of what they thought about me that I was more concerned about their feelings than someone who actually loved me. And here's the hook to that. My sister and my brother and I were put in an orphanage. And so when your only family that you have connected to is taken away from you, you really learn how much that person means to you. And I think for me in my near-earth experience is that so much was taken away from me in my, once I came back, that I learned to appreciate so much of my life. So circling back to my near-earth experience, I was taken to a place called Bordeaux. And this is quite controversial. People always send me emails and messages and comments on my podcast. Bordeaux, excuse me, Bordeaux, many Catholics call it the limbo, purgatory. Bordeaux, the Buddhists call the in-between, is known as the thin veil. I was taken to the thin veil, the Bordeaux, the in-between place, and this is where I was able to look down at our planet. And this is very important because what I saw was what we as a collective consciousness, because of the opinions of others, were doing to the planet. When I looked down and saw the oil refineries and all the residue and the toxins going into the rivers, I saw dead fish. I saw children becoming sick. I saw what the pharmaceutical companies were doing. The drugs that were being created to cure one disease, creating three more, four more, three more diseases. Over and over, again, no judgment. But what I began to understand was that we don't appreciate, oftentimes, our home, meaning our planet, our, our environment. And I, over and over again, I continue to see these things that, in my opinion, looking down, I remember this conversation I was having with this being, far more advanced than the being I sat next to in, in, the, in the tree, my life review. I can honestly say to your listening audience, I know for a fact that this was a God or a God, because I remember looking down at all we were doing to our planet. And I remember I was touched by how dogs and cats were being just beaten. You know, horses, seeing horses being run into the Everglades because the owners had, had become tired of, of keeping them. And so they would feed them to the alligators. These things over and over again, I was seeing and witnessing on our planet that really to me were to this day, Yes, they sound horrific. Yes, they're horrible. Are we even aware of this? No, because what we do, we're so much in a hurry, as I said, in our cars, going to work, going to the gym, it's always fast paced. And we never get a chance to really see the other part of the world that's so dark. So I got a chance to see the darkest part of the world through our environment, through the massacring of the animal kingdom, through the destruction of the plants and the trees and the forest. And I say this because this is extremely important. Everything is connected to one. I am no more than the plant. I am no more than the tree. I am no more than the rock. We are all matter, carbon, protons, neutrons, electrons. Everything is one. I go back to thought consciousness. I go back to religion. I go back to science. I go back to new age thought. We as spiritual people know this. And I think for me, looking down at all this moment in our life, at our, at our, at our life on this planet, on, on, on Mother Earth, it really shook me to the core. And I remember saying to this being I call God, this is not what God intended. And I remember that moment, it's almost though this echoed throughout the universe, throughout the galaxies. And the voice said, do you want to go back? And for me, and you'll hear this, not very often, some of us are given choices to go back. Some don't want to go back. They want to stay where they are. But I was given a choice to go back. 
and why this is so important because I got a chance to see my life going forward. I got a chance to see my past. I got a chance to see my life review, but I also got a chance to see my future. Do you want to go back? The voice said, and I said, yes, I knew the complications I would experience medically. I knew the relationships that would leave me. I knew it all, but I also saw on this planet, I saw nurses and doctors. I saw teachers. I saw neighbors. I saw people making a difference on this planet. I saw people helping each other out. I saw paramedics rescuing those who were burn victims. I saw doctors in the emergency room at the critical stages of life or death. I saw all these things. Do you want to go back? Yes. I hit my physical body. It's almost as though as I'm leaving this galaxy of this, this encounter with this being, and these fragments of energy. And this is very important too, because this is we don't talk about this in near death, uh, near death the experiences. It's kind of washed over. On one side, you see all these gold fragments, souls coming to Earth. On this other side, you're seeing souls leaving the Earth, going to the cleansing station. And these souls have made choices to come back. These souls have we have a start date. And we have an expiration date. Each one of us is in line to the above. So we could go tomorrow. We could go today. We don't know. There's no guarantee. But what I did see when these souls that were coming back, advanced souls, sometimes that were coming back to make a difference on this planet. What I discovered was some of the most conflicted, beginning parts of their life, being handicapped or being poor or having a speech impediment. They knew in going back into this particular earth plane that they had to overcome their challenges and become, you know, it's almost like training to become an athlete. You just you train and you train and you train until you perfect your skill as an athlete. And so I think so many of these advanced souls came back and said, let's get all this hard stuff out of the way so I can do my work on the planet. And then you also see these souls leaving and so, as I said, as I'm coming down to earth, I remember when I hit my physical body, I remember the impact. It's like someone just shoved me against the wall. And I remember soul, spirit hitting physical body. That feeling of, it's like I said, it's like just that, like having a car accident, that impact moment. And I remember the moment I hit my body, I could smell the drugs in my system. I could feel the incisions the, from the surgery. I could, the odors of the drugs, it just, it was just horrid for me. But I also could see, again, these colors. I didn't know at the time these were auras because I didn't know anything about auras. I could also hear voices. And I think for me, I ended up in intensive care. And I think they said I was unconscious for three and a half weeks, not quite four, but thereof. I went in on November the 11th. I came out during the Christmas holidays. When I opened my eyes, I could see Christmas decorations out in the hallway. So there's like a part of my life, birthday, Christmas, all before me. And during this time while I was in the uh, intensive care, my girlfriend at the time would come to me and read to me. She was a numerologist and an astrologer, but she was extremely religious. And so she kind of incorporated religion and numerology and astrology and would teach me all these different sciences. And she, her gift was how she approached religion with numerology. And so I learned all this while I was unconscious. And so for three and a half weeks, she read to me. She taught me about Aries. She taught me about Taurus. She taught me about Scorpios and Leos on down the zodiacal sign and how she related to numerology. So as she's reading to me, I'm digesting, downloading, understanding everything she's saying to me. And going back to that moment on the other side, three through three, two, 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 all these quantum fix and numbers, even though we weren't talking about those codes or those quads at the moment, she was teaching me basic numerology while I was unconscious and I was getting it. I remember watching my own doctor who came in to see me and she was there by my bed reading to me and he asked what she was doing. And she said, I'm reading to him. And he said, well, he can't hear you. She said, yes, he can. So for those of you who have 
family member who are in, unconscious or in comas, please tend to them. They're up here looking down at you, watching, loving, and learning and, uh, and appreciating. Uh, so back to that moment, I remember when I opened my eyes, I remember the doctors around me and I could see my friend Nora uh, in the back of the, of the room go get me some numerology books. That's probably one of the first things I said. And she looked at me, you know, shocked. And I just, that moment there was, <sighs> coming back from a car wreck, coming back from being murdered, coming back from a plane crash, all these people I have spoken to throughout my many years in lectures and near-earth experiences, all of us have these kind of traumatic endings. The challenges medically that we all face are beyond challenging. That's not even a great word to, it's just, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. The medical cost. I was given three months to live if I didn't know the surgery. They were feeding me with morphine because the pain was so severe. I didn't know at the time that the prednisone and that the, malt, the sulfur drugs, all this medication they were feeding me. And I, say this is quite important. So imagine a 12 year old or a, or a one year old boy or being born or had an accident and you're feeding this child, you know, overdosing this child with morphine. For us who come back from near earth experiences, we're kind of like reborn. We are, our spiritual DNA is kind of woven in a different fabric. And so at the time, what they were giving me, though not knowing what they were doing to me, they were basically killing me again. So I made a point to myself after listening to Nora talk to me about medicines and talking to me about numerology, don't ask me how I know this, but I knew that I had to get on a pure aloe vera juice. I had to wean off the, 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 the sulfur drugs and wean off the prednisone. I knew I had to get pure garlic in my system. I knew I, that the diet they were giving me, jello and broth, just wasn't enough to get my body functioning again. So I took over. And I began to wean, I began to take vitamins and herbs. Everything that I was supposed to do, I did. Because I think looking back at that, when they said I had three months to live, even if I did the surgery, they were gonna do a radiation. And if that didn't work, they would do chemo. They could uh, explain to me what happened to me and why I was having these reactions to all the drugs. And they couldn't explain why I lost my eyesight. They couldn't explain to me why I couldn't walk. So here I am in the hospital, suffering all this stuff, knowing what I saw on the other side, do you want to go back, seeing my mission, knowing I was traveling around the world, knowing that I wasn't stuttering anymore, knowing I was doing podcasts. I saw all of this and it became my mission. Wow. That is a phenomenal experience. You tell it so well. So I want to start with your life review because when I first started interviewing people who had near-death experiences on my channel, I was most touched by people who had a life review experience because it seems to, of everything people encounter, change their life when they come back the most. So you said that you saw these different, this being, first of all, with you. And I've mm -hmm. had a lot of people explain that they had somebody, and sometimes it's their soul family. Sometimes it's a spirit guide. This happened a while ago for you, to you. Have you figured out who the being was that was with you when you had your life review? I talk about this in my book, Key Master. I had an encounter in St. Thomas during the Easter holidays. I, at this time, I was agnostic. I was in a horrible relationship, went over to the islands. St. Thomas and Carnival was equivalent to our Mardi Gras. You go there and you party, you were in college, you did drugs, you drank, you just, you were just party, party, party. And I had this encounter looking back at it. If you know anything about Nordic angels, the tall angelic realm of the six foot eight, blue eyed, blonde, white hair angels. And again, I didn't know at this time, I had an encounter in St. Thomas on Good Friday. And this person being, this man kept coming to me with, as though he knew my life. You could call it a guardian angel, whatever you want to call it. But I ask for those of you who know much about Nordic angels, do your homework of how Nordic angels usually come to those who are about to have a near-earth experience 
or stay with them for the rest of their lives because they've had a near-death experience. They're like your guardian angels and they stay with you. I've had this encounter for 26 years and it always seems to happen around Easter. It's interesting that we're doing this interview because this coming week is Good Friday. And so it's for me, Easter, Good Friday are the moments I remember because even in my second book, The Excellent Prophet, I start in Laguna, Easter weekend. St. Thomas and Keymaster was all about Easter and what happened in St. Thomas and St. Croix and St. John's. I learned through all my research that there are grids on the planet, Egypt, Sedona, Maui, so on and so on. But there are all these different ley lines too on the planet that connect to the angelic realm. And so what I have done for so many years and why this is so important about 11-11 and Good Friday I celebrate my near-death experience 11-11, and I celebrate it all the way until November the 29th. And why I do that, because 11-11 and 290 equal 11, right? And so I offer myself to the universe and to be of service. I also do my cleanse. Please forgive me for these things I did. And I, I keep a kind of a running diary of all those things that I should not have done, did do. Maybe I should have said sorry. Maybe the opportunity to present sorry to that person. So I keep a running diary of all these things. So when I go off and do my grid work to these PowerPoints, I ask for forgiveness. Please forgive me for my human error, where I didn't shine, where I could have shined. I also bring my, my I call my manifest list. My manifest list is, may I be of service? Uh, I'm a good speaker. I'm great at numerology. May I be of service to mankind with these numbers? I offer myself up as a person on this planet to be of service. And that's what I do from 1111 until 1129. And I do the same thing on Good Friday and Easter Sunday because I had this encounter with it. I had this encounter with an angel. I call it an angel. I don't know what else to call it. Interesting for those of you who know about angelic encounters, you never remember the name, but you remember everything else about them. And everything goes in slow up. So slow motion, everything around you becomes, it just, it, it's, it's a standstill. But you are hypersensitive and you listen. And many people who've had near-earth experiences have that being that steps in in a car wreck, shows up mysteriously and helps them out of the car. And then, of course, that person disappears. Those are your angels, your earth angels, your guardian angels showing up. And so that's what I've learned about my encounter with these angels they are to me these tall blue-eyed um, intelligent beings and i pay close attention especially as i said good friday and easter sunday because i most of my unusual stuff that's happened in my life has been around my birthday and or easter so is it safe to say that the being that we that i asked you about that was in your life review was one of these angels yes wow okay I'm going to take this in a totally different direction because you mentioned several things sure. when you were answering me. You talked about the pyramids. You talked about the grids. You talked about the repetitive numbers. And I feel like based on things that have happened to you very synchronistically on these types of days and this Easter, which is ironic, it's five days from today. Are these a breadcrumb? Are these a guidepost? And our numbers codes, because you mentioned for one second codes, and I feel like this is all tied in. Well, for me, again, going back to my near-earth experience, knowing these numbers meant something. Now, let's go back to the 90s. Google? Nah, Google wasn't there. So what I did, I went to a place called the Bodhi Tree in Los Angeles, which used to be the biggest metaphysical bookstore in the, in the nation. It was like the place to hang out. And if you wanted something on the, the Sanat Kamor, if you wanted something on an angelic encounter, if you wanted something on, on a quad or, or a compound number in numerology, that's where you went. So I became this little nerd, this little nebbish of, of brainiac. I had to do my homework, I had to research. And as I was trying to research this angelic encounter and try to research all these quads and compound numbers and karmic numbers that I saw on the other side. And we repeat karmic numbers that I saw on the other side. I was uncovering the ley lines on the planet. 
I was uncovering Sedona. I was uncovering Maui. I was uncovering uh, Glossenberry, Stonehenge, Bath, Canterbury. All these things were angelic encounters took place. And so it was, to me, what happened, they were all interconnected to one path to understanding. So going back to that collective intelligence, going back to zero to 60, reading the Bible, but also imagine reading Anne Rice, imagine reading God, Darwin. There's so much information that you download. And for me, it was, I was zapping out. But at the same time, if I even got one fragment of information about the Nordic angel, what we refer to as Sanat Mora, then I was thrilled. I remember when I came, when I was at the Bodhi tree, and I kept describing in all my lectures, this blonde, blue-eyed, tall being. And then I went into the Bodhi tree, and there was this little photo that I still keep in my treasure chest of, of research of this blonde Nordic being with these blue eyes. It's almost like a Pleiadian. And so as I said, so was I guided by this being from near death to now? I'm going to say yes. But wow. yeah. I've also had many encounters with other angelic beings on this planet. And here's how it works. When you are doing your homework, when you're not coming from a place of get because when you're coming from a place of get the job and get the money and get the apartment and get the relationship you're coming from a lack consciousness and so what i've learned to do was come from a place of how may i be of service god universe angels because when you offer yourself i offer myself as a humble student may i be of service you tell me where you want me to go you provide the people, the places, the situations, and my job is to show up in faith, not in fear, because we all do that. Well, suppose I don't get that relationship. Suppose I don't get that job. Suppose I don't get that money because I got to pay my rent. We write that inventory in our head. When I was on the other side, I kept seeing ego and insecurity and fear. What I did see on the other side as well was where I shined, where I helped, where I showed love. And so what it did for me, it gave me a, a, a meter a measuring point, if you will, a seesaw to stay. What we do here, we are spiritual people and we're, it always seems to be sick or we have the bad relation. We can't get out of that relation. We always are always in an imbalance. And for me as a spiritual person, and it's daily work, you have to stay between the material world because we're here for abundance, but you also have to stay in the spiritual world because that's why we're here as advanced beings on this planet, as new age people or new thought consciousness people. And so for me, the idea of keeping that balance of being of service and by, by being in a place of gratitude, I receive. That's the most important gift I learned on the other side. And that's what I learned from this angelic encounter. Be grateful. Well, Be so grateful. you... This is amazing because you segue you segued right into one of the areas I wanted to come back to, which is fear. So you mentioned that you had that intern and that intern treated you with fear as you were being taken into the hospital. And then you had this life review and you saw what fear was. So that for the people watching, they're likely not going to have a near-death experience. And so they watch these things to hear about these experiences, to decide what they believe about them, and to also gain little pieces of information that help them in their own lives. So what would be the number one most important thing that the people listening could do to help them overcome the fear? Because it seems like this is one of the most important things that we come here to do. Excellent question. In order to manifest, you have to be in a place of peace. In order to be in place of peace, you have to be grateful. Got it? Got it. And that's where we kind of mess up. Because, well, I had this one client. Well, okay, so I'll do your homework and I'll go out there and I'll be grateful. But will I get the job tomorrow? Do you see what happens? We circle back around the fort with that old mentality. And therefore, we're not getting it. And she, why does it keep? happening to me why am i not getting the job or how come i have this bad relationship because somewhere in that hook somewhere in your past maybe it was your father maybe it was your mother i don't want to go into psychology 101 but i think there's also that spiritual thread from previous lifetime after lifetime that in this lifetime an example i was an alcoholic in a previous lifetime and i didn't complete my 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 mission as a writer 
got it. I looked down and, and saw my life review and what we, this is to this is another rabbit hole. So I want to go down to this just yet. But you do see your previous lifetimes as well. So when you're looking down at your life and you're seeing these things you didn't do in your previous lifetime, what karma is a balancing point to come back. And what I didn't complete in this lifetime, my mission is to attain that hopefully. And what stops us is the fear. Well, I can't write. Or my husband says, I can't write this book. Or my job, I'm traveling and working all over the place. We start sabotaging ourselves with negative thoughts, insecure thoughts. And we, before we start out the gate, we've already shot ourselves in the foot. So I go back again to what I just said. What I learned, and, it, and I'm just saying this works for me. So I'm not trying to be preachy teach here. Every day, I have a gratitude bike ride. Now, I can't run anymore to this day. It took me a while to even to get on a bike. But I can bike ride. So every day... I get on this little, what we call a dry riverbed bridge. And so tomorrow morning at 9-11, you'll be on my gratitude bike ride. And I'll go Aww, to this dry riverbed so awesome. and look at Mother Nature and say, thank you so much for this amazing interview where two or more gathered shifts take place on the planet. And so we need to come to a place of faith and not fear. We need to come to a place of hope and not hate. We need to understand that there is a polarity consciousness going around. And I say to everyone, stop watching the news. Stop yes, reading something amen. inspirational. <laughs> Go do something that helps. I tell people, well, I'm bored and I'm retired and I don't want to do it. I said, well, go to the animal shelter and volunteer. Make yourself a vehicle or vessel on this planet to help something that needs love. Mm. And so if people understand that, what happens, think about when you compliment someone or you're helping someone, you feel so good. Well, imagine doing that every day. Here's my mantra, provide the people, the places, and the situation. And my job is to show up in faith, not fear. And the other one I do, okay, God, let's see what you have in store for me today. Now, I never know who I'm going to meet. I never know what's going to happen. And for podcasts, I don't even advertise anything. New. People seem to come to me. And for some reason, I say, thank you, God, for providing me this interview, because it means the world to me. And if you and I today have one person who tunes in today and they're con they're sh they shift their consciousness, that makes sense to me. Maybe I need to be more helpful. Maybe I need to volunteer. Maybe I need to get out of this negative relationship. Maybe I'm in a bad job and maybe I need to find my authentic purpose. If we nudge them, we've done our job. And what's lacking, and this is my big bandwagon, we've lost hope. If you give people hope, they will run miles with that. But if you give them fear and hate, people turn inward and they don't want to leave and they have no faith. And we look at our, our politics and oh, who do we, uh, we don't know what to believe. We look at our judiciary system. We look at our pharmaceutical companies. We look at all these things and we become hopeless. But good story here. Years ago, I went to a lecture and LA has this big, huge metaphysical convention, like in, I can't remember, in October, November. And it's, it was Marion Williams, the Louise Hayes, you name it, every amazing speaker, Dwayne Dyer at the time, blah, 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 blah. All these great speakers, right? And I thought, well, I've read their books. I, mean, I, I want something impactful. I want something exciting. I want something that's really going to just really grab my heart. Provide the people, the places, and the situations. My job is to show up. My inner voice said, go to this little room. I traveled down to this little room and there was one man in this room with seven people talking. His name was Rick O'Berry. And Rick O'Berry, no one knows who Rick O'Berry was because here we had Louise Hay, here we had Marion Williamson, and I could go down the list of all these amazing metaphysical speakers. And here was Rick O'Berry. Rick O'Berry was the man who saved the dolphin. Rick O'Berry was the man who started Greenpeace. Rick O'Berry was the man who went in his little canoe against the Heinz Corporation, that big old huge vessel, and stopped the massacring of the dolphin. And I listened to this man's lecture, and I was so passionate about what he was doing, and I felt so connected to the dolphin because he presented a subject that was so amazing to listen to, and everyone left. And I said, well, I can never do what you do. I said, that's just so amazing. He said, yes, you can. He said, but find your authentic purpose. That's what he said to me. Find your authentic purpose. And he said to me, and I'll never forget this. 
one person can make a difference on this planet. Is it you? Impact moment. So I went back and I haven't stopped. I have not stopped. You have to ask yourself, why are you doing what you're doing? Because you are passionate about it. I look at your eyes and see the, the, the sparkles, the twinkle of what you're doing because you are so in love with your authentic purpose. You want to help. You want to guide. That's where we are in consciousness right now. And if you're in a bad job, you have a choice. Again, do you want to go back, Peter Anthony? I'm giving you a choice. Yes, we all have a choice. Get out of the victimhood. Get out of the poverty consciousness. Get into what you're supposed to be doing and make a difference. Now, is it going to happen tomorrow? No. Is it going to happen the next day? Maybe. Or the next day after that? Maybe. Maybe there's a possibility. But if you rewire yourself and believe that you have purpose and your job is to give yourself hope, watch what happens. I've seen over and over people doing amazing things on this. I've traveled all around the world. And I say over and over again, there are great people here we know nothing about that are doing God's work. And so you can't tell me that we're not here to be of service because I see it. I've been invited to go to Uganda to help these children who are, are poor. I'm going to do it. I don't care. I just think it's such, as I said, if there's something I can do just to even give one child hope, sign me up. Sign me up. And you can see, I just have this passion about life right now. I have this need to do something great on this planet. This is my last incarnation. So as I go out and I'm going to do like Tina Turner, I've come to earth to do what I'm supposed to do. It's time for me to go. That's where I'm in conscious right now. You let me do what I'm supposed to do. I know time's taken away here, but let me do what I want to do. And I'm not giving up. Again, going back to when you can't walk, what you don't have, you appreciate when you can't see, you appreciate. When I go out to that bridge and, and do my gratitude bike ride with you and my wish list, when I look out and see the Cardinals, when I look out and see the Roadrunners, when I look at the, the, our snow-covered mountains, you are part of that dream for me. You are part of that vision for me. You are part of that, that, that I know that I'm here on this planet because you're interviewing me and that gives me purpose. And that gives you purpose. Years and years ago, no one listened to me. I was made fun of. I went on my first national television told about my near my near earth experience on a Jerry Springer type show. I won't tell you what show I did. I was laughed at, ridiculed. They even had a clown there on the stage who booed me with a sign to the audience that says boo. And the audience stood up and booed me talking about my near death experience, which was so fragile. And so when I see someone like you and these other podcast people coming around and interviewing me, I say, thank you. Thank you so much because it means the world to me. Sorry, I just... No, actually... you shouldn't be sorry because these emotions are so real. I can feel you oh. in how you are so passionate about this. That was so powerful. Like, I want everybody to stop right now, stop this, rewind it, go back and watch the last five or seven minutes where you were sharing all of those nuggets of wisdom that you brought back from the other side. And there were so many and it started with fear but it went so much further than that so one of the questions i'd like to ask you is you saw your future mm -hmm. self have you started or begun to have deja vu moments as you've experienced them in this lifetime i am now do you know what synesthesia is yes i do it's where you can yes it's where you can feel numbers or smell numbers or taste things differently right not only can you smell the numbers but you're connected to the auras of the universe, trees, plants, animals, the sidewalk. Yeah. On Friday nights, I drive home. And as I'm driving down a uh, street called Sunrise, I look into the skies and I've learned the more advanced I teach my, I call, I humble my, my ego. I allow myself to be grateful for what's happened to me that day. Even every lesson, I don't care how harsh it is today. You have to take the higher perspective. What did happen today? What did I learn from this? But as I'm driving down sunrise, I look into the skies and I see these almost like cobalt blue laser-like colors that I saw on the other side. And I can look up and let's say it's 11, 11 at nighttime, or I can look up, I'm at 333 uh, Indian Canyon. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. When you 
advance your consciousness and we start seeing the thin veil, we start seeing our life before us, what we're here to do. You also have those angelic encounters. If you want to have an angelic encounter and you're geared consciously and prepared for sunrise, sunset, mountains, beach, shore. That's where they, that's where they are. That's funny, just like My in places. the movie Michael at the end where they're all sitting there watching the sunset and the sunrise. It's very true. All my angelic encounters that I've experienced, mountains, Easter, Good Friday, Labor Day, Christmas. Wow. That's amazing. Mountains, I love it. Thank ocean, you for sharing that. Trees. Yes. Okay. Okay. You mentioned that in your near-death experience, you saw the bundle of information about the planet. Mm -hmm. And you said that it was important. Can you share with us what you remember that you feel is most important about the planet that we need to know, that we should know, that will help us on our journey? Mm -hmm. If we only understood how intelligent the animal kingdom is, you would not destroy or kill. If we understood how powerful the trees are, we would not kill and destroy. If we knew how important the sky was, we would not pollute it. We are not playing our part. So I'm gonna go back to this. This is an amazing question. It's a simple answer. We have let people in power that we put in power, that we vote for to put in power, to take our power away, who vote against the planet, who vote against the curing disease. AIDS could have been cured years and years ago. We allow other people to take control of our life. Their opinions matter more than ours. And we think, well, I'm just this little tiny person here in a little condo and I can't make much difference. No. If you only thought, knew how powerful prayer was, when you're in prayer, and I'm talking about real prayer, not, oh God, please, I need the money. If you just promise me this and now get this job, I promise I'll go to church. That's not how, that's not prayer. That's begging. That's a lack of consciousness. It goes back to God, I love myself, help me to walk through this conflict. You know my needs. You know, I, I'm not able to pay my rent. You know, I'm in a bad relationship. I need you to step in because I cannot do this by myself. We don't ask questions of the universe. We, we beg, we plead, we scream, we cry. <laughs> Mute. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not getting there because we're all over the place. But if you have an authentic, keep it simple, May I be of service? I say may I be of service because they get that. Think about this. The stars, the planet, the trees, Mother Nature, everything's in sync. We're not. We have been, we are stuck in sales mentality. Do you know what I mean by that? Best picture, best actress, Super Bowl, uh, the Academy Awards, the best tennis player, Vogue. We, we are sold in the world of physicality, TikTok. I'm not making fun of all these things, but we got to be this perfect woman here or this perfect man here because they're on the cover of Vogue or, or GQ or whatever, Sex Man of the Year. We get caught up in that consciousness. And meanwhile, over here, the planet needs our help. Over here, there are people who are starving. Over here, we have war in Ukraine. Over here, Middle East is in turmoil. Well, what can we do? One thought. One connected thought, prayer, help these people. In your name, I ask. And if you want to follow by amen, then do so. But we need to collectively come together. What I've seen here, and I've traveled everywhere, all around this planet, lecturing. We need to have a... I remember back, we had Hands Across America, we had Farm Aid, we had Live Aid, we had Queen, we had all these amazing things where a collective consciousness came together. We're not doing that anymore. We go back to what I said earlier, where two or more are gathered, that's where shift of consciousness takes place. We need to come together again. And what's happened, COVID brought us back into Zoom, cyberspace, by ourselves, feeling alone, not knowing what's next. We can't pay my rent. We're in this world of doubt, fear, 
insecurity, not knowing. You got to stop. And I said, again, this is something I'm very passionate about. Start believing in self. We have to become little athletes. So if you're lazy, get up. Have your coffee, go run. Go take a walk. Look at Mother Nature. If you're a procrastinator, get all the hard stuff out of the way. If you're a writer, you write. If you're a singer, you sing. If you're a dancer, you dance. That's what authentic purpose is. So for those of us who feel we're not serving because we're a, a, an accountant and I want to be a Reiki master, you have to take baby steps towards where that goal is. And so what I say, well, you're not going to quit your job tomorrow, right? Or today or, or the next day, but take baby steps. And I say this, love what you do until what you love comes along. And that to me is what I did. I mapped out from the news division and media, I mapped out my life. I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn this. And yes, I put up a lot of people that I <laughs> look back and like, well, you know what I'm saying? We all have those moments in our work life. But I also knew I had the finish line, my island to swim towards. This was my, this is where I was, my, my ordinary world, which was conflict with career, money, and all that kind of stuff. But over here was authentic purpose. So every day was a step closer to authentic purpose. And so, as I said, if you have an island to swim towards and know that's your goal, you'll swim towards that effortlessly. And you'll wow. do it because you want to do it. Yeah. Sorry, there I go on my preachy teachy, but I just, I really, it, I have so many people come to me in my lectures and they're all at the road and they're my, my boyfriend and this, my job, my boss. And then you're just like, just, I get all that. But go back to choice. What are your choices today? I think that's great. And it's super helpful. I'm going to ask you one more question. Then I'd like to know where uh, people can find you. The last question I have for you is you mentioned music. Music is so important. It is so healing. It's a frequency. And I feel like things in the future are going to go towards healing modalities that invo involve light, vibration, and frequency. So you mentioned that you had these experiences with this music on the other side, and you kind of touched on something that's similar mm. to that music. Have you found anything that you can share with us that people could listen to that reminded you of that music you heard during your near-death experience? Well, when I became a parallel investigator, I had to do a split screen reality between the physical world and the spiritual world on camera, walking into areas that had been haunted. I learned to work with the left brain and the right brain simultaneously. And I did that through music. So what I would do before I went into to work on a case, I put my headphones on, get into an ultra state of consciousness. And for me, it's trance music. Now, for my younger audience, and they'll get this, I tune into Arman Van Buren out of over Europe. He's this wonderful DJ that has this really wonderful female melodic music that's trance. When we think of, when we think of Enigma, when we think of all these different people, I tune into music that basically gets me into an ultra state of consciousness. And here's how it works. And it's gonna, it's complicated, but it's, it, but I'll make it simple. When we read, we go into the alpha, the beta, the theta, and the delta consciousness. Does that make sense? We go into a rim cycle, okay? The 90 minute rim cycle. When you read, you go into an altered state. When you watch a movie, you go into an altered state. When you listen to music, you go into an altered state. We need to continue to go into music that inspires us, movies that inspire us. And when we get into that altered state and we align our chakras, that's how you connect to the other side, to manifestation, to your authentic purpose. I listen to music day in it's that what is it like the hc port i can't remember what the what's what it's called the hc hc frequency um the hertz can you frequency. can you share it with me for everybody if they want to connect to it people can connect to what you're talking about yeah there's just go to your meditative sites in other words after when you look at these during the podcast you'll see that there are different trance songs in example like tibetan bell so you'll see that there's native american uh, rituals you'll Here's how it works. Each and every one of us has our own grid on our body. Got it? The same thing with our music grid. There's going to be certain sounds that we listen to. Mine are 
Tibetan bells, that chimes in the distance. I hear that. Also, and I don't know why, maybe I spent a previous lifetime there, I hear these Middle Eastern chants, uh, the, but they're melodic, echoing voices. I hear the, the kahuna in the background. So there's all this stuff for me that's very important that I listen to. So when you go in and you're looking at near the podcast or whatever spiritual podcast you're looking at, on the right side of your screen, you'll see Tibetan chants, you'll see Native American chants, you'll see Celtic. And then what happens, put your headphones on, listen, and you will feel your body like what happens when you have an earth experience, leaving the physical. All of a sudden you get into this altered state of consciousness and it works for me. And that's then you'll amazing. start seeing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot it's of sense. It's kind of simple, but that's what that's how it works for me. And uh, and there's not a day that I don't do that. There's not a day that I don't do that. Because as I said, it allows me to go back to the realm. What people don't know about, and they never ask us, when you had an earth experience, that feeling when you're on the other side of love and compassion and kindness, the, the all-knowing, you feel connected. There's not a day that I'm not trying to find that feeling. It's like going home. Beautiful. Well, this is why I, for years, listened to near-death experience. Uh, you know, it's stories that people shared because it did the same thing for me. Movies, I connect with a lot. I'm actually going to post right here. I did a movie list, the top 10 spiritual, inspirational movies that have influenced my entire life for the last 35 years. So I'll post that so people can connect to that also. Well, I met Fried Green Tomatoes, The Color Purple, The Legend of Bagger Vance, Green Mile. These are great movies to watch because what it does, it teaches us hope. I watch The Help over and over and over. When you're writing a book, you have to introduce the character in an ordinary world. And then here comes the conflict. Here comes, here comes the point of no return. Now what happens to the main character? All of us have that in our life. And so I said, so get out of the ordinary world and do something extraordinary. Find your authentic purpose. And that's where your life will change. You found your authentic purpose. I found my authentic purpose. We are both doing planetary work and we're blessed for doing so. Thank yeah, you. I agree. Thank you. Well, I could sit here and talk to you for hours and hours more. We have really, I feel like only grazed the surface of what we could talk about. I'm so grateful for your time and for what you're doing. And I'm sure that the people that are listening would love to connect with you. One of the things we didn't really get into very much is that you in your professional life have, after your near-death experience, been so connected to the other side that you've been able to solve a bunch of crimes. And that's another, I feel like I'd like to have you come back on and we can talk about that. And don't, do you have another book that's coming out as well? Well, I'm, I have three documentaries out right now. I'm working on one. So it's in the throes of trying to get it together. It's the suits. <laughs> Those well, when you, when you are done, book. when you're done with that documentary, I would love for you to come back on and have another conversation so that we can connect again. Cause I just thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. This feeds well, my go story. to my website. You go to my website, theaxonalprofit.com. There's a whole list of all my shows and, and cases that I've worked on in, in the video section. I have three documentaries out right now. One is Beyond the Grave. One, I understand from people, are, are, something's on Hulu. I have no idea. I've done so many, I forget. I kind of lose count of all the, the different shows I've done, but I know three are current right now. And I'm one that I'm very passionate about that, I, that I'm working on right now that I hope that the suits that make the decisions will at least listen to it in a pitch. So we'll see. We'll see. I mean, wonderful. Yeah. Well, I hope that everybody checks that out and they have so much more that they can learn from you, but thank you. I am grateful for well, our thank time you. together. And I am also grateful because I really and truly believe that when I do these interviews, it doesn't matter how many people it goes to because the people who are meant to hear it, will find it. So if you've gotten to the very end, bless you, you're here for a reason. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> and, thank you, and thank you everybody for watching. All right, have a great life. Next up, check out this playlist of other NDE interviews. Please like and subscribe. It really helps this channel to grow so I can bring you more content. Thank you for watching. I'm so glad you're here.